As the tide of the Second World War turned against Hitler and the Nazi regime, one man's dream would give the Fuhrer hope of deliverance from defeat through the use of a new wonder weapon. That man was Germany's poster boy for rocketry, Werner Magnus Maximilian Freiherr von Braun. Von Braun was obsessed with space travel and rockets, and in the early 1930s, the German military offered him the opportunity to expand his research. It was a time when Germany was coming under the influence of the Nazis, and many scientists decided to leave. One of those scientists was Albert Einstein. Einstein was Jewish, and as early as 1932, he could see the threat that Hitler posed, so he left Germany for good. Another scientist who left Germany in the 1930s was Edward Teller, who went on to work on the Manhattan Project. He would later say, Having escaped from Hitler, I think I had a good idea, or rather, a horrible idea, what was at stake, and I was among those who were exceedingly eager to do whatever was possible to stop this horror. Von Braun, on the other hand, was born into an aristocratic Prussian family and was not affected by any discrimination. So not only did he decide to stay, he also joined the Nazi party. When war came, Von Braun, now an officer in the dreaded SS and working at Peenemunde next to the Baltic Sea, pressed ahead with the A4 rocket development. There was no doubt he knew the true purpose of the rockets he was working on, because the facilities at Peenemunde had one purpose, to develop weapons. In July 1943, von Braun, newly promoted to a major in the SS, met with Hitler at the Wolf's Lair. As the Führer was shown a film of a successful A4 launch, von Braun talked about the rocket's progress. Thanks to von Braun, Hitler was even more sold on the terror weapons, saying, What encouragement to those on the home front when we attack the English with it. This is the decisive weapon of the war. Albert Speer would call this meeting a turning point, the moment when Hitler saw the A4 as his salvation. Propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels would coin the term V weapon for vengeance. And so the A4 rocket became the V2. From all of this, it is obvious that von Braun was not a man who was being coerced into working for the Nazis. This was a man who was the driving force behind the A4 rocket. He would call his work on Hitler's vengeance weapons his contribution as a good citizen to his country's war effort. Following a bombing raid on Peenemunde in August 1943, it was decided to move the production of the V2 underground. Prisoners from Buchenwald concentration camp were relocated to the site and forced to carve out the new production facilities that had been called Mittelwerk. If von Braun's involvement in the war had been questionable up to now, it was about to get a whole lot worse. The conditions at Mittelwerk were some of the worst endured by prisoners of the Nazi regime. During the construction phase of the underground facilities, the slave workers worked unbearably long hours in terrible conditions on starvation rations. This led to the highest death rate in the entire concentration camp system. Exhaustion, disease and savage beatings by the guards all added to the hell of having to live, work and sleep in the tunnels they were constructing. On top of these horrors, dozens of workers were executed every day for the slightest infringement by von Braun's fellow SS officers. Although based at Peenemunde, von Braun made regular visits to the production site at Mittelwerk and was fully aware of everything that was going on there. When asked about these conditions after the war, von Braun stated, I saw the Mittelwerk several times, once while these prisoners were blasting new tunnels in there, and it was a pretty hellish environment. This would be a rare admission of first-hand experience of the slave workers from a man who preferred to distance himself from such things. One survivor stated that von Braun just passed by us without looking at the bodies, without any sign of emotion. By this time, slave labour was nothing new to von Braun because he had already witnessed it first hand at Peenemunde. Once production of V2s at Mittelwerk had started, workers were moved from the tunnels into a newly built concentration camp called the Mittelbau Dora complex 
which had been completed in December 1943. Von Braun would later deny any knowledge of the camp, saying, Well, you are misinformed. Uh, the slave camp was about 400 miles from where I worked. But he must have been aware of all of this, because as one writer stated, the rocket base and the concentration camp were the same place. In fact, as more workers were needed, sub-camps were set up, with Von Braun taking part in the discussions to bring in more slave workers. With an almost impossible production rate of V2s being demanded, self-preservation was the order of the day for Von Braun, even if that meant prisoners dying by the thousands. In fact, a letter dated the 15th of August 1944 stated that Von Braun had personally gone to Buchenwald concentration camp to ask the camp commandant there for more slave workers for use at the Mittelwerk factory. In his own words, Von Braun had implicated himself in the procurement of slave labour from a Nazi concentration camp. The request for workers to be sent to a location that built his terror weapons was made in the full knowledge of the conditions that existed there. It was well known amongst inmates that to be sent to Dora was to be sent to almost certain death. As the war became even more desperate for the Nazis, Hitler demanded in August 1944 that the vengeance weapons begin their reign of death from the sky. The V2 was a true terror weapon, a weapon so insidious that it fell from the sky with no warning. Unlike the V1, if you heard the noise of a V2, it meant that you had survived the attack because the weapon travelled at three times the speed of sound. It had an explosive force that General Dornberger, a leader of the V2 rocket programme, described as being like 50 locomotives, each weighing 100 tonnes, impacting the ground at 60 miles per hour. When it did strike the ground, the V2's warhead was capable of leaving a crater up to 10 feet deep. One witness would state that the reverberations from one V2 rocket explosion spread up to 20 miles. The V2 was launched for the first time against the Allies on the 7th of September 1944, when two weapons were fired against Allied held Paris. On the 8th of September, another weapon was launched against Paris, and two were sent to fall on London. For the first time, Londoners felt the shock of a sudden explosion within their city. The first V2 weapon to fall on London killed a 63-year-old woman, a young soldier on the way to meet his girlfriend, and a three-year-old child. Von Braun's contribution as a good citizen to his country's war effort had begun and he celebrated with champagne. From that moment to the end of the war, approximately 3,172 V weapons were fired against targets Hitler thought needed the attention of his terror weapon. As well as London, Antwerp would also feel the wrath of Hitler's vengeance weapon and would become known during that terrible time as the city of sudden death. On the 16th of December 1944, a V2 struck the cinema wrecks in Antwerp, killing 537 people, many of whom were children, and injuring 700 others. This would be the highest loss of life on the Western Front from a single weapon from the sky. Von Braun's rocket weapon was allowing Hitler's madness to continue to bring misery and death to cities that had already suffered terribly throughout the war. He would later justify his participation in the prolongation of Hitler's war by saying, a war is a war, and when my country is at war, my duty is to outwin that war. In the same month as the Cinema Rex attack, Von Braun would attend a banquet at which he would receive a telegram congratulating him on the awarding of the Knight's Cross of the War Married Cross with Swords. As a smiling Von Braun received the gratitude of Hitler, thousands were dying as a result of his work. As he sat and ate at a banquet, the slave workers building his rockets were starving. One prisoner would write, Hunger, it torments each one, every second, minute and hour. It is never at rest, even in dreams. As the war neared its end, Von Braun could quite easily consider himself a war criminal, but luckily for him, the space race, or at least the race for the knowledge and hardware for rocketry began. Even before the Second World War in Europe came to an end, both the Soviets and the Americans sent specialist teams to seek out Germany's rocket experts and relocate them to where they could work on their own rocket programs. Making it safely to the border with Austria, it was a very smug looking Von Braun who surrendered to the American forces on the 2nd of May 1945. As Von Braun escaped from the dying embers of Hitler's war, he was sent with other German rocket experts to the US Army's Fort Bliss near to El Paso, Texas, 
under the cover of Operation Paperclip. He would also settle down at the age of 35 by marrying his 18-year-old first cousin. With a new menace rising from the flames and destruction of continental Europe, the Nazi engineers would have their pasts swept under the rug. Their knowledge was going to be invaluable to the Americans if they wanted to stay ahead of the Soviets. Other notable Nazi scientists and engineers who would make it to America included Kurt Heinrich de Boos, who was described as an ardent Nazi and worked as the V Weapons Flight Test Director. After the war, he would become a director at NASA. Arthur Rudolph was Operations Director for V2 Missile Production at the Mittal Work Site, where up to 20,000 slave workers died. In America, he would be the Project Director of the Saturn V Rocket Program. The FBI stated that there is no question that he is a war criminal. Dieter Grau was an engineer working with Von Braun on the V2. When instances of sabotage were discovered at Mittelwerk, he was sent to discover the culprits. Punishment for the saboteurs was a slow and painful public execution. Later, he would perversely become a director of quality at NASA. It's a sad fact that circumstances existed to allow such a deplorable group of human beings the chance to work on mankind's greatest achievement. Used beyond, a survivor of Mittel Baldora declared, everyone forgot the hell those Nazis created to build their rocket. As for von Braun, just like he had dazzled Hitler with the promise of wonder weapons, he dazzled the Americans with the promise of space rockets and with his past expunged, he would end up at NASA working on the Saturn V rocket that would send men to the moon. It was a long way away from Peenemunder, where another prisoner said, I could hear Von Braun talking about the ultimate weapon that's going to destroy the United States and everything else. There had indeed been plans for a rocket that could cross the Atlantic to hit America, but they were cancelled. So what are we to make of this man? In the final analysis, after wading through the sanitization of his background by the US government, the post-war narrative spun by the man himself and the general ambiguity surrounding the evidence available. It is probably true to say that Von Braun was not a dyed-in-the-wool fanatical Nazi. He did wear the paraphernalia of the Nazi regime, the swastika party badge and the black uniform of the SS death cult. But like his membership of the Nazi party and his commission in the SS, these things were done to allow him to further his career. Did his terror weapon qualify him as a war criminal? Winston Churchill, no less, wanted the rocket scientist hung. But if Von Braun had been executed, it would have smacked of victor's justice, given the fact that the Allies were blanket bombing German and Japanese cities. In his defense, Von Braun said, we wouldn't have treated your atomic scientists as war criminals. Finally, when it came to the slave workers, there was probably very little he could have done to alleviate their suffering. On the other side of the argument, while other men of science saw Hitler and the Nazis for what they were and made the decision to leave Germany, von Braun had stayed. Was he, as he liked to say he was, just a naive young man who got dragged further and further into Hitler's nightmare, unable to speak out for fear of what might happen to him? Well, this is questionable. In February 1944, Himmler made von Braun a personal offer to join him and work on the V2. Von Braun turned down the offer and this displays a certain level of autonomy when it came to his own actions because Himmler was not the kind of man you turned down. Von Braun's much vaunted tale of his arrest shortly after this meeting, which he would later use as a sign of his anti-Nazi credentials, did in fact owe more to do with his refusal of Himmler's offer along with the SS chief making a power play within the party than any anti-Nazi sentiments that Von Braun states he made. In any event, Von Braun had the backing of the Führer, whose orders soon led to his release. So there were few people in a position to threaten him. Despite his claims that he made anti-Nazi comments, Von Braun certainly praised Hitler's successes during the early years of the war, and he was quite willing to accept Hitler's patronage, his awarding of the title of professor, and the medals and accolades. There are also no wartime accounts of von Braun protesting against the atrocities committed by the Nazis. When it comes to the prisoners he encountered at Peenemunder, the Mittelwerk facilities and the Mittelbau Dora concentration camp, there is not one single incident where a slave labourer stated that von Braun alleviated their suffering in even the slightest way. Von Braun saw the use of slave labour 
and their horrendous treatment as something he was willing to go along with. There are, however, claims that Von Braun hit one prisoner and had another whipped. These may be true, because Von Braun was quite ready to punish those he saw as threatening his own position. This was vividly displayed by how he personally delivered what has been described as a brutal beating on his brother Magnus, who had been discovered trying to sell stolen plutonium from Fort Bliss. American playwright Marcus Ito, who wrote the play Man in the Moon, said of Von Braun, Von Braun's complicity with evil led to one of humankind's most sublime achievements. What happens when the advancement of knowledge collides with the human ethics? Our rockets to the moon were fueled with the blood of thousands. Those victims deserve justice. Von Braun would never face any kind of justice. He died of cancer on the 16th of June 1977, aged 65. President Carter said of Von Braun, to millions of Americans, Werner von Braun's name was inextricably linked to our exploration of space and to the creative application of technology. He was not only a skillful engineer, but also a man of bold vision. His inspirational leadership helped mobilize and maintain the effort we needed to reach the moon and beyond. Those glowing words were all very well, but to the victims of von Braun's rockets, he would simply be known as an amoral opportunist who had worked on Hitler's ultimate terror weapon. For all of his genius, von Braun had aligned himself with pure evil.